Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nigel Henderson. I am a Great War researcher. That's to say, I research the Great War and I'm great at it. Uh, allegedly. Um, my particular interest is Belfast Presbyterians, of which there are ten and a half thousand that I'm trying to research. Um, but I get involved in other little bits and pieces. I'm very pleased to welcome members of the extended Donnelly family here this afternoon. They had a fantastic commemoration service event up at the Queen's War Memorial earlier on this morning. And I'll be talking about their relative later on. So thank you very much for coming. Um, <clears throat> San Quentin, German Spring Offensive. There's a German name for it. What's the German name, Michael? Kaiserslap. Um, it's also called Operation Michael. There's a number of different terms, but I'll probably be sticking with St. Quentin. Um, when I was preparing this talk, which I've given in a couple of places, I noticed there's a number of anomalies between the three main sources of death dates. Commonwealth War Graves Soldiers Officers Died Great War and the Register of Soldiers Effects. Commonwealth War Graves tends to record men as died between the 21st and the 29th of March whereas the other two sources tend to be more specific. Um, so, what I'm going to be doing, when I'm talking about statistics and people died, I'm going to be referring to people where the 21st of March is recorded as their date of death in at least two of the primary, two of the three main sources. So, other people may have other statistics, and that's fine, but that's the basis for this, the statistics that I should be providing. So the two divisions that were raised in Ireland that um, served on the Western Front, 16th Irish and the 36th Ulster Divisions, suffered 1,044 fatalities on 21st March 1918. I've got them ordered there um, by, their, uh, by the, um, the provinces. But you'll notice a significant figure is down here. The number of men from outside of Ireland that died with the Irish Division and with the Ulster Division. 716 fatalities from the 16th Irish Division on one day. 41% of those were born outside of Ireland. The figure at the bottom is the numbers of men who died on 21st March who were commemorated on the Posier Memorial. And for the 16th Irish Division, 76% <coughs> of the men who died on this day, a hundred years ago, have no known grave. That percentage might drop a fraction later in the year, but it'll be a very small fraction. And it'll go from 544 to hopefully 543. More of that later. Six, um, the 36th Ulster Division had 328 fatalities. 45 of, the, of, of them were born outside of Ireland and 51% were born outside of Ulster, the nine counties. So we've immediately got a scenario where both the Irish Division and the Ulster Division are no longer intrinsically Irish or Ulsterish, whatever phrase you want to use. And that's because the losses during the, the Battle of the Somme and then later during um, Messines and Landmark were so heavy that the drafts coming in, there weren't the recruits in Ireland, and the drafts coming in were coming in from English regiments, from Scottish regiments, from Welsh regiments. But also, one of the Channel Islands had a company attached to the 16th Irish, and the other main island, and I can't remember which way around it is, had a um, company attached to the Ulster Division. So you maybe get Jerseymen down with the 16th Irish and Guernseymen with the 36th. Of the um, Ulster Division fatalities, 83% have no known grave. They're commemorated on the Posse of Memorial, but 83% were because the lines were overrun so quickly, they couldn't recover and identify the fatalities. This slide is a very quick slide. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this. This shows the, the breakdown for the Ulster province into Greater Belfast and then the, the nine counties. The only one where there's a consistent number is Londonderry. All the others show a, a slight towards one side or the other side. Not that we should be using sides in terms of 
Irishman or Ulsterman who died in the Great War. Another interesting thing I came across whenever I was looking at this, starting to prepare, was the number of men who died on the 21st of March who had been awarded a gallantry award at some stage during the war. 60 of the 21st March fatalities have received some sort of gallantry award. And by gallantry award, I mean um, a military medal or military cross upwards or a, uh, an award from the French government or the, the Belgian government. 37 of these men were from the Irish division and 23 from the Ulster division. The one Victoria Cross winner was Edmund de Wind from Cumber and today a new memorial plaque is being set, installed in um, next to the War Memorial in Cumber. So that's another commemoration. Um, members of the de Wind family are over for that and that's an exciting development as well. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to talk about men who received gallantry awards at some stage during the war and died on the 21st of March 1918. The first one is um, Sergeant Gerald King, who was a dis distinguished conduct medal holder and a military medalist. For those of you not familiar with the structure of um, the gallantry awards, the highest gallantry award in the British Army is the Victoria Cross. In the First World War, um, for officers, the next important one is a distinguished service order, and then it drops down to the military cross, and then it drops down to being mentioned in dispatches. Those are the official um, MOD or Army Department uh, awards. For other ranks, after the Victoria Cross, it drops down to Distinguished Conduct Medal and then to Military Medal. So this man won a medal that was one step down from a Victoria Cross. He was born on the 23rd of July 1896 at Upper Townsend Street in the Shangri-La area of Belfast to Martin Kane and Kathleen Braithwaite, being the second of their five sons. <coughs> Throughout this talk, when I'm talking about, when I'm referring to a man's birth, I'll refer to his father and his father's surname, but I'll refer to his mother's surname <coughs> and his mother's maiden name. That is purely and simply to save me having to say nay whatever, time after time after time. Like his father, Gerald was a, a printer-compositor, and so was his elder brother. So obviously he was a bit of a, a family um, trade. The family was living at Woodvale Avenue in sort of northwest Belfast in 1901, but had moved across the river to Western Street in the Pollinger District by 1911. His attestation papers and service records are no longer available. They were destroyed by the Germans during the Second World War when they um, bombed um, London. But it is known that he entered the theatre of war on or after the 1st of January 1916. We know this because he was only entitled to two of the service medals, the British War Medal and the Victory Medal. The Star Medals were only awarded to men who arrived in the theatre of war 1914 or 1915. And that was to distinguish men who had volunteered from men who were conscripted through the Military Services Act. Now in Ireland, the Military Services Act did not apply. But still there's that distinction, so that men who had volunteered to go to war were entitled to a star medal, but those who had been um, conscripted were not. He joined the 8th Battalion of the Inniskilling Fusiliers, part of the 16th Irish Division, in France, in, probably in January, February 1915. The London Gazette reported the award of the, the Distinguished Conduct Medal on the 13th of February 1917, and this is how the citation reads. For conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, he led his company to the final objectives after all officers and senior NCOs had become casualties. So at this stage he wasn't a sergeant. He ended the war as a sergeant, or he was a sergeant when he was killed. Based on the timing of the notification and the content of the citation, it can be assumed that um, Gerald King was awarded the DCM for his actions in either the Battle of Gilmont or the Battle of Ginchy in September 1916 as part of the Battles of the Somme. Generally you tend to find that there's a, a lengthy lapse time between an act of gallantry and the award being um, pursued and decided upon and um, gazetted. The London Gazette reported the Military Medal Award in February 1918, 
but there's no accompanying citation describing the act for which that medal was awarded, and that is common. I have heard that there's a man in London who rescued a bunch of cards from a skip which describe or which contain the notifications from line commanders recommending men for um, a military medal. That could just be an urban myth. I'm hoping it's not, and I'm hoping it becomes available. In addition to the two official awards, Sergeant King had also been awarded a division, divisional gallantry certificate. The division, divisional gallantry certificate was um, something which individual divisions had printed and issued. Where they had maybe recommended a man for an, an official award and had been turned down, it was like a, a compensation. It was a just to say, well, look, we recognise that you're at the country by awarding you this certificate. Sergeant King was killed in action on 21st March 1918, 22 years old, commemorated on the Posier Memorial and on the War Memorial Tablet for the Printers, Stationers and Allied Trades in St. Anne's Cathedral in Belfast. It is a beautiful, big marble um, memorial. It records the names of the fatalities in the middle and the two sides. Um, contain the names of those who served. In amongst those is the name of the owner of the Belfast Telegraph at the time. Which is amazing that you've got this owner of the, the Belfast Telegraph and his name is just in there along with all the others. And I can't remember his name. Peter? Bird? Yeah, William Bird. William Bird was co-owner, he was the junior partner, his brother or his half-brother um, Robert Baird was the, the, the main director of the company at that stage. William Douglas McGookin, another Distinguished Conduct Medal winner. He was born on the 15th of May 1880 at Henry Street in Belfast to Thomas McGookin and Mary McCulloch who had ten children, although only six of those had survived until 90, by 1911. All were sons and William was the eldest of those sons. His father was a carpenter and the family lived at Meadow Street in the docks area. William, who had served in the South African Wars with the Royal Engineers, was a bricklayer when he married Dor Dorothea Cockey on 19th November 1908 in Glastry Presbyterian Church down in County Down. In 1911, they were living in Newport Street in the Cliftonville district, but they did not have any children. And looking at the um, birth record, records after 1911, it, it seems that they did not have any children throughout their marriage. At the, out, at the outbreak of war, William was a company commander with the 3rd Battalion North Belfast Regiment of the UVF, and consequently he enlisted with the 15th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles, which had the byname North Belfast Volunteers. It would be wrong to assume that everyone who enlisted in the 15th Battalion of the Rifles had been in the UVF. I can't stress that enough. <laughs> he held the rank of rifleman when he was deployed to France in October 1915 and was awarded the DCM for an act of conspicuous gallantry on the 21st of November 1915. So within about six weeks in France, he's been awarded a DCM. And this happened at Beaumont Hamel. He held the rank of company sergeant major when the citation was published in the London Gazette on the 22nd of January 1916 and the medal was bestowed by Brigadier General Hackett Payne at a ceremony in Belfast City Hall grounds on Tuesday the 29th of August 1916. Um, for those of you familiar with um, Belfast City Hall and some environments, that's the Ocean Building. That building there is what um, was the Linen Hall Hotel and is now uh, an Art Deco building whose name I can't remember but it's, it's quite a nice plain Art Deco building. So that's, um, City Hall would be behind here, Robinson and Cleavers would be over at this side. The citation for his award read, hearing that a wounded man was lying out near the enemy's lines, he went out with 2nd Lieutenant Harper to his rescue. After proceeding some 350 yards, they found the wounded man only about 20 yards from a German listening post and carried him back onto heavy machine gun and rifle fire, which the enemy opened up on them. The man in the inset here is the man who McGookin brought back in off the battlefield. 
His name was Rifleman Thomas Williamson, also of the 15th Rifles, and he died of his wounds on the 23rd of November 1915, aged 20. McGookin risked his life, and Lieutenant Harper's life, risked his life, going out to bring in a man who subsequently died two days later. But of course they did not know that at the time. They knew there was a wounded man, they didn't know how badly wounded he was, and the decision was taken by them to go out and bring him in. He was 20 years old when he died, Thomas Williamson. His mother, Edith, died of pulmonary tuber tuberculosis on the 29th of November, 1915. So just six days later. According to local newspapers, she died within um, a few hours of hearing of her eldest son's death. I don't know, I can't say how true that is. I can't see a connection between receiving shocking news like that and dying of tuberculosis, but it's something which may have prompted or offset the onset of the disease quicker. William McGookin was subsequently commissioned on the 27th of March 1917 and was serving with the 12th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles when he was reported missing on 21st March 1918. He was aged 37. He's commemorated on the Posier Memorial and on the Road of Honour for Cliftonville Presbyterian Church. That memorial is now in Ballyhenry Presbyterian Church out sort of um, Newton Abbey direction. Three of his brothers also served in the Great War. The man, oops, sorry, the man standing here, Royal Flying Corps, and it's quite appropriate that we have Royal Flying Corps as we're coming up to the centenary of the creation of the Royal Air Force. Um, Alexander was with the Royal Flying Corps, Daniel with the Royal Army Medical Corps, and David with the Royal Engineers. All of them survived the war. John Brown, Captain John Brown, this is one of my favourite stories, because um, there's just so many aspects to it. John Brown was born on 20, 20th of April 1894 at Bloomfield Avenue in Belfast. I thought you were asking a question there, Stephen. <laughs> and by the way, if anyone does want to interject and ask a question, please do so. Um, his father, his mother died on the 30th of November, 1903, when he was, what, nine years old. His father was an assistant postmaster for Belfast, and the family lived at Oakland Terrace before moving to Elsa Terrace on the Hollywood Road. If you're familiar with that area, Elsa Terrace is a, a row of semi detached or of terraced houses just after you turn onto the Hollywood Road opposite the cinema. Um, the buildings are still there and Elsa Terrace is still um, on the, the side of one of the houses. John Brown was a clerk in the linen business with Richardson, Sons and Alden Limited. Again, for those of you familiar with Belfast City Centre, the Richardson, um, Sons and Alden building later became the, uh, the water office, water rates office, and was then purchased by um, Marks and Spencer and is part of the Marks and Spencer store. And it's a beautiful red stone, red sandstone building. Um, at the outbreak of war, he received a commission with the 8th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, which again was his local geographical battalion. And he received his commission on 14th November 1914, being deployed to the Western Front in January 1916. He was badly wounded on the opening day of the Battle of Albor, being awarded the Military Cross for his actions on 1st July 1916. The citation read, or reads, For conspicuous gallantry in action, he led his platoon into the enemy's line with great dash and courage, subsequently driving off an enemy bomb attack from a post on his flank. He was wounded in doing this, but carried on and completed his task. The medal was presented to Captain, um, Captain Brown at Buckingham Palace by King George V in December 1916. So bad were his wounds after 1st July that he was evacuated home to recuperate. And it was on the 8th of September 1916 he was involved in another act of bravery. Whilst travelling over the Albert, this is, this is almost word for word from Belfast Newsletter article, Whilst travelling over the Albert Bridge on a tram car, John Brown observed a crowd looking over the parapet and saw that there was a young boy in the river. He alighted from the tram car, removed his overcoat and jumped into the wagon and brought the boy safely to the riverbank. 
Now, at that point of the river, depending on where the tide was, um, you've got a drop probably of about 15 feet from the parapet to the water, and it's then probably another 15 feet of water. And this is in September, and this is in Belfast. So it would have been cold. The newspaper article report records that he resumed his coat, didn't put it back on, he resumed his coat, and was conveyed home in a passing motor car. For this act of gallantry or bravery, John Brown was awarded the Bronze Medal by the Royal Humane Society in October 1916. That's the, the Bronze Medal of the um, Royal Humane Society. That's the Military Cross. He returned to the Western Front and was awarded a bar to his Military Cross and the citation being published in the London Gazette on 29th May 1917. For conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty, he went forward with a machine gun team and some men of his platoon and engaged two enemy machine guns, one of which was captured. He set a fine example of courage and initiative. Captain Brown was serving with the 1st Battalion Royal Irish Rifles when he was reported missing from, um, from 21st March 1918. His death was not confirmed until February 1919 and his name is commemorated on the Posier Memorial. He's also commemorated on the Road of Honour for Ballymacarrick Presbyterian Church, which is about a mile from here, well the building is. The War Memorial plaque for Ballymacarrick is now in the Somme Museum down at Conleg. He's also commemorated on a family memorial in Belfast City Cemetery. And if you ever want a tour of Belfast City Cemetery, I know a man who does theme tours. Peter McCabe sitting at the back, He's also bringing out a book, I believe, <laughs> on Belfast City Cemetery, a series of different tour guides, um, people who were shipyard workers, people who were Methodist ministers, people who were sports personalities, and so forth. It'll be a great wee book. Alexander Conway was born 7th July 1896 in Kingswood Street in Belfast to Matthew Conway and Agnes McFadgen, being the third of their seven children. Both his parents had been born in Scotland, as had his two elder brothers. His father and two elder brothers worked in the shipyard. Don't know which one, could have been Workman Clark, could have been Queen's Island or under both, as either iron turners or blacksmiths. In 1911, the family was living at Thistle Street in the Pottinger district, and Alexander was recorded as being a messenger. He was initially deployed to the 1st Battalion Royal in the Skilling Fusiliers on or after 1st January 1916 but was serving with the 7th, 8th Battalion, called 7th, 8th because after the battles of, um, that, they'd gone, that had gone before, the, those two battalions were merged. The 7th Battalion and the 8th Battalion were merged into one fighting unit, and they adopted the name of the number 7th, 8th, part of the 16th Irish Division. Um, he was killed in action on the 21st of March, age 21, and is commemorated on the Posia Memorial. In July 1918, the London Gazette reported that the King of the Belgians had conferred the Croix de Guerre on Sergeant Alexander Conway. And this medal is the Belgian Croix de Guerre. The French also issued a Croix de Guerre. It does not have a crown because it was a republic and not a monarchy. Another aspect of this campaign, of the um, Battle of St. Quentin, was the phenomenal numbers of prisoners of war that the Germans took. It is estimated that 21,000 British officers and other ranks were taken prisoner on the 21st of March, 1918. 21,000. Cyril Falls, in the official history of the Ulster Division, claims 185 officers and 5,659 other ranks were reported missing during the offensive, with four fifths taken prisoner. That's his estimate. Based on that, 4,675 men from the Ulster Division were captured on one day. On the 1st of July, 1,785 men from the Ulster Division died, and about 5,500 were wounded. So almost as many men were taken prisoner on one day as were killed or wounded on 1st July 1916. The Irish Division would have had similar levels of prisoners taken. Unfortunately, there's no source that I'm aware of 
that goes into the, those sorts of details. Joseph King, and I'm indebted to the um, to Robert Snow, Snowden and his family for this um, photograph and for some of the information that I'll be sharing. Joseph King was born at Clonovan Road in Ballymena on 24th January 1895 to John King and Mary Peacock, being one of their 12 children. How do you fancy having 12 children? <laughs> In 1901, John King was a boot closer. Does anyone know what a boot closer did? No? I don't either, unfortunately. And I don't even know what industry it's in. The surviving five sons, the surviving five sons and three daughters were living at Prospects Arm Place in Balmain in 1901. By 1911, they were living at Seaview Street in North Belfast, and Joseph and his father were both recorded as being general labourers. Joseph King enlisted with the 3rd Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, a reserve battalion, on 28th August 1914 and was deployed to the 2nd Battalion of the Rifles in France on the 11th of January 1915. When Operation Michael started on 21st March 1918, the 2nd Battalion was in the St Quentin area but by the 24th had been pushed back near to a village called Cougney. Is that right Michael? Cougney. Cougney. Sorry. My French pronunciation is terrible. The only thing which is worse than my French pronunciation is my Belgian pronunciation. On that day, Captain Charles Bryans had command of the 2nd Royal Irish Rifles, and he decided that a withdrawal of open country between Soup, Cooney, <laughs> and Bielsel was impossible or impractical. At 2pm, a German barrage of artillery and machine gun fire preceded an assault with aircraft support. After the assault, only three officers and 95 men were left alive. Captain Brands reported, By the time the enemy was upon us, there was scarce a round left to fire. Many only had their bayonets. Rather than wait for the end, they jumped from the entrenchments and met it gallantly. It was an unforgettable sight. We were overwhelmed, but not disgraced. It was during this stand, this final stand, when the second Royal Ash Rifles effectively ceased to exist as a fighting unit. 48 men, including Joseph King, were taken prisoner. He was subsequently imprisoned in the prison of war camp at Stendhal in, Sa in Saxony, being repatriated on the 28th of December 1918. This is his POW record, um, produced by the Germans. There's only one problem with it, it's all in German. But you can see there, Lager Stendhal, Lager is um, the name that they had for a prisoner of war camp, and you can see where he was taken prisoner, or where he was taken prisoner, and when. Interestingly, it's got to be his third Royal Irish, but he was actually serving with um, the second Royal Irish. That's because the third, fourth, and fifth Royal Irish rifles were reserved, they never went to France. He was posted to a depot unit on the 30th of December after being repatriated and was transferred to the Special Reserve on the 4th of April 1919. He was finally demobilised on the 27th of August 1920. During the Second World War, Joseph served with the Civil Defence as an ARP warden and having ushered people to the bomb shelter on 15th April 1941, he went back to his house in Northwood Parade and was sitting in his chair puffing his old Great War pipe when the air raid started. This information is from the family. A small incendiary bomb came through the roof into the living room, about 20 feet from where he was seated. Joe put it out very quickly with a couple of buckets of sand. <coughs> Rifleman Ashley Albert Milne was born on 7th November 1898 at Arundel in the Grosvenor Road area of Belfast to Thomas Milne and Caroline Dunn, being one of their 14 children and their youngest son. His father was a linen lapper, and the family was living at Roden Street in 1911. Ashley Milne enlisted with the Reserve Battalion of the Ulster Division and was deployed to the 15th Battalion on the Western Front in 1916. He was captured at St Quentin on the 21st of March and held at Lagensalza Camp and Zerbst Camp, where he died of pneumonia on the 19th of July, 1918. 
So four months after he was captured, he dies of pneumonia. It's quite possible or probable that the pneumonia was due to any wounds that he had incurred um, during the offensive. He was 19 years old and is buried in the Berlin Southwestern Cemetery. He's also commemorated on the road of honor for Broadway Presbyterian Church in Belfast. The church is now um, the Am Culture Center on the Falls Road. It's a, a Gaelic um, cultural and community center. They've retained the building, they've added onto it, but they've retained the, the facade, the outside of the original church building. And they do very nice coffee. He's also commemorated on this family memorial in Belfast City Cemetery. Did I say I know somebody that does tours at Belfast City Cemetery? So I'm going to go on to look at a few of the other fatalities from, from the, um, the battle. The first one is Edward Edmund Burnside. Whilst over at Queen's this morning at the War Memorial, I placed a poppy cross at this man's name on the memorial. Also on the memorial of another man, but we'll come to him in a few minutes. Edmund, or Edward Burnside was born on 10th May 1898 at Lawrence Street in Belfast to Ingram Burnside and Minnie Elizabeth O'Neill, being the eldest of their four children. This is a more middle class family, the number of children is smaller. His father was a commercial traveller in the tea business, and the family lived at Lawrence Street in 1901, before moving to Bladen Drive in the Malone District, so moving up in affluence, and later to Green Island. Edward was educated at Royal Belfast Academical Institution. Let's said about that, the better. By the way, we have a, a, a former um, inmate of Belfast, Royal Belfast Academical Institution with us today. The aforementioned Peter McKay. Any other men's people here today? Anyone from Campbell? No, then I can proceed safely to say that I went to the school which is the premier rugby playing school of Ulster. <laughs> and I don't mean BRA either. <laughs> um, educated at INST before receiving a scholarship to Queen's University in October 1916, he joined the Officers Training Corps and following four months training in Fermoy, he received a commission with the Royal Irish Rifles, being deployed to the Ulster Division's Pioneer Battalion on the Western Front in December 1917. In his last letter home, he wrote that he was looking forward to a period of home leave in April. This was written probably in early March 1918, possibly late February 1918, but he said he was looking forward to a period of home leave in April. But he was killed in action on 21st March, 1918, age 19. He's buried in the Grand Seracor British Cemetery and is commemorated on this family memorial in Belfast City Cemetery. He's also commemorated on the War Memorial tablets in Fitzroy Avenue Presbyterian Church and White Abbey Presbyterian Church. Obviously the family, when they moved to Green Island, they switched churches and even though it's quite possible that um, Edward never attended White Abbey. He was still put in there one and because the parents were members of the congregation. I'm going to move on to our final case, which is Carl Gilbert Donnelly. I hope I don't get any of this wrong to the Donnelly and Doherty family. He was born on 25th July 1897 at Willowbank Gardens in North Belfast to John Donnelly and Jemima Doggart. John and Jemima had married in the Roman Catholic Chapel in Port Rush on the 18th of May, 1882. They were both from North Belfast. One was from the Protestant tradition, one was from the Roman Catholic tradition. Why they got married in Port Rush, I do not know. It's possible that they ran away because there was maybe opposition to their marriage within the family. Would that be a fair assessment, Mark? Thank you. They had 13 children between 1883 and 1900, 10 of whom survived. Their last child, Hugh, was born on 22nd February 1901, and Jemima Doggart died of a combination of pneumonia and childbirth complications on the 6th of March 1901. 6th of March. This is the um, Donnelly family. Carl Gilbert is boxed. On his left hand side is his father and 
three other brothers, all of whom worked in the drawing office 200 yards from here, more or less. They worked for Harland and Wolf in the drawing office. It's possible that some of them were involved in the design of that famous ship. What's it? The Olympic. <laughs> Not to be confused with the one which was okay when it left Belfast. <laughs> John Donnelly was a first class assistant superintendent of postal telegraphs and the family lived at Glastonbury Avenue off the Antrim Road in the Duncairn district of Belfast. Samuel James Donnelly, Austin Frederick Donnelly and Henry Edward all worked for Holland and Wolf. This is Samuel. Who's this one? John. This one? Henry. Thank you. Just keep you on your toes there. Gilbert Donnelly was a medical student at Queen's University when he enlisted at Belfast City Hall on the 26th of October 1915, with his father having to sign for him because of his age. On the form he, ex he expressed a preference for infantry and with a preference for an Irish regiment. He didn't really mind which Irish regiment it was. He wouldn't have minded if it was a, I think he wouldn't have minded if it was an Irish regiment part of the 10th Irish, the 16th Irish, or the 36th Irish, 36th Ulster, or indeed one of the um, battalions that was part of a regular division. He just wanted to fight in a unit with other Irishmen, leading other Irishmen. He received his commission by the Officers Training Corps and was deployed to the um, 1st Battalion Monster Fusiliers on the Western Front in August 1916. He participated in and survived the major battles of 1917, the Seams Ridge in June, Battle of Landmark in August. Although the 1st Battalion Monster Fusiliers was a reserve deployment during the Battle of St. Quentin, Gilbert was acting as a spotter for Lewis Gun Crew when he was shot in the head by a German sniper near a beet factory in the tiny hamlet of St. Emily or St. Emily, depending on your pronunciation and probably not my pronunciation. He was 20 years old when he died on the 21st of March. No known grave and commemorated on the first, on the Pozier Memorial. That's a later photograph of him. Um, that's from the Belfast Evening Telegraph. You can see, um, still you know, quite bright eyed, but by, by the time you get to this photograph you can see the eyes are dulled because he's already been through some action by the time that photograph was taken. On 13th March 1919, John Donnelly received a letter from the War Office containing a statement relating to Gilbert from a repatriated prisoner of war, Sergeant Dooley of the First Monsters. I actually saw Lieutenant G. Donnelly, Royal Monster Fusiliers, dead about 400 yards in front of St. Emily on 21st March 1918. We were holding the third third line, brackets brown line, and Lieutenant Donnelly, who was at the time commanding my company, was shot through the head and killed. I knew Lieutenant Donnelly well. As a prisoner of war, I was one of the party detailed to bury the dead and saw him buried close to St. Emily. There is a known unto God headstone. Known unto God headstones is where they recovered a body but could not identify it. And it says on it, um, a lieutenant of the Royal Monster Fusiliers, 21st March, 1918. An English descendant of Gilbert has submitted a comprehensive case to Colmouth Wargraves to get this grave confirmed as being the grave of Gilbert Donnelly. He's the only Monster Fusilier officer of that rank who died on that date, and it's known from the repatriated POW's account that he died and was buried near St. Emily. It's got to be him, it can't be anyone else. I'm going to invite Mark Doherty, a direct descendant, to say a few words. This, I, I was going to try and get some photographs. Part of the Donnelly family laid um, flowers at the grave at dawn this morning. Um, I was going to try and get some of those photographs in, but 
time resisting it. So sort of that one. This is this photograph, by the way, is the War Memorial at Queen's University Belfast. Thank you very much, Nigel, for the opportunity to say a few words today on this um, very memorable day for the family. Gilbert had left for war from Glastonbury House, a lovely location on Lambton Road. Lovely be up to Cave Hill and then down to the shipyards where his brothers um, worked. Um, it, um, it, it was obviously sadly missed by his large family as two of his brothers named sons Gilbert after. In fact, one of them followed his father Sam into the shipyards. So there was a tradition of over 60 years of being designers in the shipyards from the very um, early great liners up to the last one, the Canberra. Uh, I'm struck by, it's only in a, recent years that I've um, come to know, in the last two years I've come to know of, of Gilbert's loss in the family. Um, I've walked past that memorial for about 34 years since I started in Queens myself before I, I knew that um, a relative was recorded on it. Uh, I, my fascination with, fascination with the First World War goes back to school where I studied was I interested in poems of Wilfred Owen. I'm very struck by similarities with Owen and Gilbert. They both enrolled in the same week, in October 1915. They both became lieutenants and saw much service on the front, both dying towards the conclusion of the war in 1918. And it really strikes me that, particularly seeing the later photograph of Gilbert and his eyes, that he has seen the horrors that were so graphically and memorably described by Wilfred Owen in his poetry. Um, yes, um, um, Nigel had mentioned that of the Ulster men who died, 83% have no known grave. And Wilbert, um, Gilbert, of course, has been counted amongst them. I'm very pleased, Dan Donnelly, is, uh, my second cousin, is with us today. He put a lot of work uh, and research into um, trying to track down um, Gilbert's remains, and uh, he submitted a very thorough report to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and we're very optimistic of having it confirmed as his, as his grave. It's really a watertight case, and we're very much hoping uh, on this day next year to be at that site for a uh, dedication of an animal memorial with his name on it. Um, moving to today, at, at dawn, Phil Donnelly, another second cousin, was at St. Donnelly Valley Cemetery at dawn this morning. He says it's a beautifully uh, kept little cemetery. There's even a little uh, little cupboard built into the wall and right with a visitor, but uh, meticulously kept um, honouring um, um, those who died for this. Uh, so he, sp he spent uh, a few minutes there with his wife and made flowers this morning. Um, he, he just said to me earlier today, he said a few words briefly at the grave. He introduced himself as Billy's grandson, Billy being um, Gilbert's brother, um, and told him that um, through the generations his family have been very proud of him and will never forget him, and we're very happy to, to be expecting to have this as his final resting place, and also said um, that there will be a gathering in Belfast today to remember him. So we, we met this morning at the, um, at the memorial in front of Queen's, and family from Belfast and from further afield. We also have representatives that are from Queen's Medical uh, Faculty, which of course Gilbert was in. Uh, also the Officer Training Court, and a wreath was led, uh, led by the Song Association. And then a piper played um, while uh, the floors were laid at the memorial. So I'd just like to, to finish then by playing a, a tune to honour the memory of Gilbert and all of the others who died in that day.
Thank you, Mark. I think that's the third time you've played for this talk. <laughs> once in Dublin, once in Sainfield, and now in Belfast. Next gig is in the Carnegie Hall in New York, I believe. <laughs> um, just to finish off, there are two books, apart from Peter McCabe's book, of course, coming out later this year. Um, Michael Nugent has written a book on the Ulster Division, specifically on the Ulster Division, during this campaign, a long week in March. And History of Ulster is bringing out a book on War Memorials in Ulster, which will look at some of the more idiosyncratic aspects of War Memorials um, around in the nine counties of Ulster. Michael, do you want to say a few words? Thank you very much. And, uh, This is the second book I've written, and it interested me, seems the first one precisely, because there was very little written about uh, 1918 and the Spring Offensive. Um, I look at uh, what placed the 36th Ulster Division in the position opposite St. Quentin on that morning, um, the recruiting issue uh, in Ireland, which, which Nigel has, has mentioned, um, the antipathy that existed between David Lloyd George and Field Marshal Haig, they hated each other. Uh, which led to a lack of reinforcements coming from uh, the UK, which then in turn led to a uh, reorganisation of the infantry battalions of the British Army. There was then a new defensive system which was implemented, uh, which nobody was familiar with. Uh, I take each of the battalions of the Ulster Division through the first day and the subsequent days of their involvement up until the 31st of March. Uh, some fascinating personal stories uh, mixed in with, with factual accounts. Um, we even have a cavalry charge on it, which, which amused me. Uh, it's been published by Helian uh, Press and uh, should be out uh, June, July of this year. So I, I'm on Facebook and uh, on Twitter as well, and I'll um, be publishing when it's, when it's published. And hopefully, maybe be here speaking about it at some stage. Thank you.